Forge welding is one of those things that people get all freaked out about. People think that it's some arcane mystery that has been lost to the ravages of time, blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. That's nonsense. Forge welding is a fundamental skill of the blacksmith. It always has been, and it always should be. Even if you're proficient with an arc welder, a MIG welder, or a TIG welder, you should know how to forge weld. It opens up lots of doors, like welding on the reins on a pair of tongs instead of having to draw all this out to make the reins. If you have a power hammer, that's not a big deal. But if you're at a small shop and you don't have a power hammer, forge welding just saved me an hour. On its most basic level, forge welding is really just heating up two pieces of iron-based material, wrought iron, pure iron, mild steel, tool steel, doesn't matter a lot, although we'll talk about where it does matter some. But you heat these up until they're near the melting point. If you heat them up to melting, you're done and you've ruined everything. But once they're sort of close to that melting point, the surfaces are just starting to think about being molten, they can be fused together under the hammer. Forge welding should be every bit as strong as the parent material is. You'll notice that I was welding at a gas forge. A lot of people think you can't weld in a gas forge, and it does depend on the gas forge. A lot of very simple homemade forges simply don't perform well enough to get up to welding heat. They can if you do a good job of building it, but the better the forge, the more likely. This is a chili forge. It gets up to welding heat. I'm at 6,500 feet, and I can manage to weld in this. I, I weld axes and adzes and froze and all sorts of things in this and it's absolutely possible. The other option is to weld in a coal, coke, or charcoal forge. For a lot of forge welds, the key to success is in the way you prepare the material for welding. And that gets into a whole lot of different issues that I'm going to try not to get into today. We're going to stay very basic today. The term scarf refers to the way the welds are prepared, a thin area that blends in nicely. And different welds need different kinds of scarf preparation. Today what we're going to do is something that is referred to as a faggot weld. And no, that is not an insult to anybody's sexuality, and you can keep comments about that kind of thing to yourself. It's a blacksmithing term, and it simply means stacking the material up on top of each other and it's not trying to blend a weld, it's actually creating a thick spot or a mass. If you've ever made or wanted to make Damascus or pattern welded steel, that's essentially a faggot weld. Stack everything up, weld it together, draw it out. There's no scarfing necessary. So I'm going to turn the forge back on. That's one disadvantage to welding in the gas forge is it takes a while to heat up. I don't want to lose all the heat that I had. So we're going to listen to this thing roar in the background. I hope you can still hear me talk. Regardless of what kind of a fire or forge you're welding in, there are some things that have to happen. You have to have the heat. If you can't get it hot enough, you're never going to be able to weld. Hopefully it's a little quieter if we come over to this side of the shop. Not only do you need the, the high heat to weld, and different materials weld in different heats. Wrought iron welds much hotter than mild steel, which welds hotter than tool steel. Depending on what you're welding, your welding temperature will be different. But you need a reducing fire. That means the oxygen is being consumed. And whether that's a, adjusting the air intake on a gas forge or the blower, if you've got a blower type forge, or simply having a good deep fire in the coal forge, you have to consume all of the oxygen. In your typical gas forge, it really is just a matter of adjusting the gas pressure and adjusting the the air intake, however that comes into your forge. But with a coal fire, in the typical forge is one that the air comes in this way. The bottom blast forge is what I have. It can come in from the side and the rules are still more or less the same. 
If you have a nice deep fire pot, it's easier to have a reducing fire. What you want is coal built up around the edge, and this area right here is where you want your material. If you're down in here, and this is where your fire is, if you're in this area, that is an oxidizing fire. There's too much oxygen. You're going to burn your material before you weld. Up here, it's just not going to get hot enough. So there's a sweet spot where you want your material. And that's the reason fire pots are built the way they are, is it's roughly level with the top of the fire pot. If you're welding in a, a riveter's forge, it really doesn't have a fire pot. It just has a grate here. So you have to really make a mound of coal and get that up about four inches off that grate to get into that reducing area. So it's a good fire pot that's and a good blower that will provide that kind of airflow is very important. The other issue is your fire has to be clean. If you've got clinkers down here that aren't really consuming any oxygen while you're burning your fire, you're gonna, still going to burn this and you're not going to have the heat. Clinkers don't consume oxygen, they just suck heat out of the fire. So you need to clean the clinkers out, clean the ash out, you need to have good coal, good coke, or good charcoal that will produce a good clean heat. That's absolutely critical for forge welding. That is one advantage to the gas forge. No clinkers, no ash, no sulfur, no other impurities. It's just a matter of getting it set right and knowing how to do that in your particular forge. That's unfortunately something I can't teach you for your forge. One enemy to forge welding is scale. If there is scale in the joint, you will not be able to get a good forge weld. <coughs> and that's one of the things that you use flux for. It melts, it's kind of glassy, and it bonds with the scale and will help clear the scale out when you weld. It will also seal the weld up so less oxygen gets to the weld surface and help prevent scale from forming. So flux is really handy and not absolutely necessary. A lot of people weld without flux and it's completely possible to do that. Flux isn't magic, it just helps. This is sodium borate, it's anhydrous borax. It's a pretty good flux, but 20 mule team laundry borax works as well. It's really foamy, but it runs down in the joint well. There's things like Easy Weld and this Iron Mountain forge welding flux that you can buy from your blacksmithing suppliers. They all work. I don't think there's any such thing as a magic flux that's way better than the rest of them. Uh, some of them have the, some iron filings which can help and some of them have no borax. Borax can be a problem after the weld in that it can leave a film that you have to clean off. But the other stuff isn't too bad. But try different fluxes, see what you like. I use a different flux for different purposes. The borax is real slippery, it gets down in the weld, but it also makes it hard for some things to stick if you're bringing two pieces together like I did in the beginning of the video, and I prefer these for that kind of a weld. First forge weld, we're going to make this very simple. We aren't going to bring any pieces together separately. We're going to keep them all attached. I'm going to cut that a little more than halfway through. Give a little wire brushing. It's not critical. This is something the flux will help clear out. And I'm just going to lay that over itself. I keep borax in a little tin. It's got a lid on it to keep the, the dirt and junk out. And this will get down in there. You don't need just tons of flux. Most people put way too much on. If you leave this a little open, you can get the flux down in there a little bit better. But if it is open, seal it up. Now we need to get this up to welding. Weld 
building heat is another one of those somewhat subjective things. You frequently will hear lemon yellow is the color you want for welding heat. And that's not a bad thing to aim for, but you're going to see color in your shop just slightly different than I see at my shop. It also depends on the time of day and whether you've got light coming in windows, or if you're working outside, you're going to see things completely different depending on what the sun's doing. So you need some other telltale signs. One of them is if you watch the surface of the metal, you'll see the flux flow because it melts like molten glass. But if you see the surface of the metal where there isn't flux starting to flow a little bit, that's a good sign that you're getting close to welding heat. If you see sparks coming out of the fire, you are too hot or you have way too much air. If you've got a hand crank blower and you're cranking just as hard as you can, chances are you're going to burn your material up without ever getting to welding heat. Think about how a cutting torch works. You get it hot, but not welding hot, and then you give it oxygen and that oxygen cuts through it. That's burning the metal away. And that can happen in your forge, even though you're not at welding heat, you can burn stuff up. So sparks are not a good thing. If you're getting sparks, you're probably too hot. A few are okay, but it's better to come up to welding heat slowly. Now, unfortunately, this camera adapts for the, the light in the forge, so you're seeing a much darker image than I am. What you can see here is that the material is the same color as the inside of the forge. And for a gas forge, once you figure out how to set it to weld, that's a pretty good indicator. That even works fairly well in a coal fire when the material disappears against the background of the coal and no longer looks like it's colder than your coal fire. You're probably at heat. It pays to turn it around and move it, but if the joint's critical what's up and down, mark it before you go into the fire. The initial weld should be light fast blows, starting at the end and working towards yourself, and that's probably welded. Well, I know it's welded. But that's really all a faggot weld is. I'm going to refine that a little bit to guarantee that it's got a good weld. <coughs> and that could be several layers of material built up. Now it's okay at this point if you want to to wire brush the flux, particularly if you're not 100% sure the weld took. And getting a little flux to make sure you can clear out all the scale isn't a bad thing. But the reality is this weld probably didn't do that. Now we can go to what, some heavier blows, it isn't as critical. If you start with heavy blows, you'll probably ruin your weld. But this is a real good way just to learn welding heat. That's not something I'm going to use for any project. It's just a, a practice weld. That's all this is. And you should do some of these just to learn how to weld. So if this weld is good, we can lock it in the vise and bend it, and it'll stay attached. That's pretty good. It's starting to separate a little bit right at the very end, but it's staying good down in here, which is where it would rather bend if it was going to separate. So that little bit's bad. And that's one of the advantages of a scarf weld, is that you would blend that end in with a scarf and it would stay better. So the faggot weld isn't something that you're really going to do a lot of, but there are some practical uses for it. And I'll show you a real quick thing you can do with it here. We're going to take just a piece of 3 8 bar and put a point on it. bend that over. We're going to leave about three or four inches out there. 
I'm not cutting this because I want full strength at the tip here. <coughs> and then we'll flux that. Let's put a little bit of flux on this. We're just going to weld about the last inch and a half of it. Put that in the fire, let it get hot. I'm going to that last inch and a half or so and I'm going to draw that out to a point. If you've got enough heat from welding you can get away with this. Another disadvantage to welding in the gas forge is I have to get all of this hot to get into where the, the good heat is. And in a coal forge you could just heat the end of it. So for something like this I would certainly prefer to weld in a coal forge. But if you haven't figured it out, what we've made is a real quick simple fire poker. Here's our original weld, and you can see where it's separated, so this part wasn't welded. But this is where it was locked in the vise. So if this part wasn't welded, it would have bent back here. So that's, that's a good weld for the most part. If it was critical to get this, you just go back and work on re-welding that. But it's just a sample, and if you can get welds like this after three or four tries, you should be real proud of yourself. But doing this is a very good training exercise. Just a good way to practice a weld. And it's all about getting the right heat and the right fire and the metal being clean enough when you come out to weld. Here's our poker now and that uses that same weld only it doesn't need to weld all the way back. But it also illustrates just slightly one of the problems with a weld like this. Let me see if I can zoom in a little bit further. And that is that it gets a little thin. You can see the weld seam in here. And it's just a little thin right at the heel of the weld. For the poker, it makes absolutely no difference whatsoever. There's still plenty of material for this to work. And it's a good, quick, simple way to make a poker. It's only took me two heats, one to make this point, and one to forge weld and draw this out. And if you're doing really well, you can finish this hook in that same heat. But a couple, couple of light heats then to refine it are no big deal. And if I wanted to refine this, I could do a lot more to it. I just, for this exercise, there was no reason to go take that any further. Maybe someday we'll turn this into a finished, very simple little poker. But the problem, if you get too thin, is in something more like this pair of tongs. And the weld on these, I did a much better job of making disappear. You can see just a little bit of the scarf right there. And just a little bit right there. And that's pretty common in old stuff to be able to see those signs of the weld. If you get too thin doing this, if you have not properly prepared the weld joint, then that's a weak place in your tongs. You actually want that to be a fairly heavy place in your tongs and not a thin spot. So the next time we talk about welding, we'll talk about preparing the joints so that when you are through forging them, that they are the right dimension and not too thin. It's real easy in a weld to get things too thin. Even this, you can see this is a lot thinner than the original bar. If we needed, this is 5 eighths bar, if we needed an inch and a quarter total width, I would have had to have done something to guarantee that I didn't lose too much material making the weld. So that's an important concept, but we'll talk more about that later. Another practical place you can use this style of welding 
is something like this lock. This is an antique. I don't make locks. I wish I knew how. But you can see this buildup right here. This is really quite small the, for the internal mechanism, but the bolt that slides into the door needs to be heavy and secure. So the smith that made this did just what we did. It's a faggot weld. It was doubled back, welded down on here, and done. Probably it's wrought iron, in which case it would have been a higher heat and welded a little bit easier than the mild steel, but you could do it in mild steel. So that's a practical example of what you would do with this kind of a weld. Now when you're welding, the flux, like I've mentioned, is somewhat akin to molten glass. It's hot, it's liquidy, it splatters, it goes everywhere. Eye protection is vital. A leather apron is really a good idea. I don't always wear it, but I have a whole bunch of t-shirts with a nice burn line right across here where the flux splatters and my clothes would last a lot longer if I wore the apron all the time. It's also why I'm wearing the kind of cheapo welding jacket. These are pretty available and they're fairly sacrificial. And I'm wearing a brand new flannel shirt my wife gave me for Christmas and I don't want to ruin it the first day in the shop so I put all this extra stuff on. Not absolutely vital. You see people weld in t-shirts and shirt sleeves and barehanded all the time. It can be done. Sooner or later you're going to get little burns on the back of your hands. It seems like scale always wants to to land right in here if you're not wearing a glove. If you're wearing a glove it seems like it always wants to go right down the cuff of the glove so it's half of one, six dozen of the other, or six of one, half dozen of the other, however you want to look at that, whether you wear a glove or not. I'm still wearing one to protect the, the finger, doctor's orders. So it's sort of up to you what you wear, the better protected you are, the fewer burns you're going to get, and the longer your clothes are going to last. But the leather apron for welding I think is really a, a good idea. And if you're bald like me, keeping something to, for the little bits of scale that fly off overhead from hitting your bald head is kind of nice. One of the viewers had asked for a little better look at my paper towel holder here. And we'll actually build one of these uh, maybe early next week. It'd be a nice simple project while we're getting back to normal around here. It's just a bent bar, this half inch bar. It's got a place for two bolts here so it's solid on the wall. It's got a little kick up so the paper towels don't fall off the end, but that has to be small enough so that the roll will go over the end. Oh, look, paper towels with no edge. But it works, uh, it works pretty well, and you can do all sorts of ornamental things to a paper towel holder like that. Nothing to do with welding, just answering a viewer's question. That's it for this morning. Just a real quick introduction to forge welding. Remember, you can forge weld in a gas forge. You can forge weld in a solid fuel forge like coal or coke. It's just a matter of what you have and learning how to use it. Good clean fire, proper temperature, properly prepared materials, and flux doesn't hurt. I mentioned that flux helps liquefy the scale and carry it away. It also helps seal up the joint, but it also helps lower the welding temperature ever so slightly, and that can be a benefit. It also helps clean the surface because it erodes it just a little bit. So if you've got some scale stuck to the surface from a previous heat, there's a good chance it'll help clean that away for you. But don't count on it as a miracle cure. More flux isn't going to make it weld. It's either going to weld or it's not, and flux may help it weld a little bit easier and may help you get the scarf stuck down a little bit that wants to cool off fast. But if it's not going to weld, it's not going to weld, and adding a gallon of flux isn't going to make it weld. That just makes more clinkers in the bottom of your fire. It is also said that the older the blacksmith, the lower the welding temperature, which means getting it to that sparking temperature isn't necessary, and as your experience grows, you will start to realize that you don't need to be that hot, and you can back it down a little bit and start seeing what a lower welding temperature is and you'll do less damage to your material and less damage to your project if you don't have it at such a high heat. So, thanks for stopping by. I hope you can get out in your shop and try some little practice forge welds. I hope you liked the video. If you did, I'd appreciate it if you give it a thumbs up. Love it if you hit that subscribe button. Feel free to share it with your friends. New Year's coming up, so if we don't do any more videos, have a happy new year. But I think I'm going to try and do at least 
two more, maybe one more this afternoon, one tomorrow, and maybe even one New Year's Eve, but we'll see. Uh, in the meantime, like I said, have fun. <laughs>